Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture one where we try to answer the question, how good is the fossil record? Now you've likely heard the quote, 99.99% of the species that ever lived are now extinct. It quickly invokes the importance of paleontology as a science since Paleontology is the study of extinct fossilized animals and plants. And 99.99% of life is extinct and of this category. So this quote is often used to justify the importance of paleontology in the study of life. But a question for this lecture is how much of this 99.99% of extinct life is actually represented by known fossils? This quote is often attributed to Stephen Jay Gould, but the earliest occurrence of this figure come from textbooks in the 1990s that cite the work of David Raup. David Raup was an unusual paleontologist at the University of Chicago who worked principally in front of a computer and rarely in the field. His interest was in quantifying the quality and nature of the fossil record from published works. His interest was in studying the patterns of extinction and the diversity of life. We'll read more about Rapp and his work throughout the semester. In this lecture, I'm going to simplify some of Rapp's work, as well as discuss how a basic examination of what we know in the scientific literature can help us address the question, how good is the fossil record? The first number that we need to uncover is how many species are living today? And this is not an easy number to find. If we simply add all the unique names of species, we find that there is about 1.7 million species which have names assigned to them. If you were to do a, a Google search, you would find a much higher estimate of 8.7 million species, which is just an estimate. In fact, scientists really don't know how many living species there are. We just keep discovering new ones every year. In fact, if the 8.7 million species and estimate is correct, then we only have named about 20% of the living species living today. More than half of the named living species are insects shown on the pie chart in blue down below. Nearly a quarter are vascular plants in red. In this lecture, we'll try to cover every group of life except the orange slice, which represents the vertebrates, which includes humans, which we'll discuss in a separate course called vertebrate paleontology. Now that we have a vague idea of the number of living species, how about the number of fossil species only known from the fossil record? Well, that number is rather small compared to the 1.7 million named species. John Allroy was the last to publish a good survey in 2002 and found about 280,000 named species known from the fossil record. More recent estimates are near 300,000 named species known only from the fossil record. The paleobiology database reports about 326,000, which includes living species with fossil records. So the, the 300,000 named species is a, is a good sort of estimate that we're going to use. If we add these additional species into our pie chart of now 2 million living and fossil species, the vast majority of named species are living. This comparison gives us a hint at how few fossils are known of the 99.99% of life that's gone extinct. But what we still want to know is how many species have ever existed and compare this estimate to what we've discovered so far in the fossil record. To do this, we need to know a couple things. One, how many, fossil, how many fossil species are there? Two, how many living species are there? Three, the age of the oldest species that we can use. Four, the average duration of the species. And then five, how has species richness changed over geological time? Each of these are really big questions in paleontology. And in this lecture, I will answer them extremely simplistically in order to start a discussion. The true answers to these questions are hotly contested in paleontology. For question one, how many fossil species are known, we'll use the figure 300,000. For question two, how many living species, 
we're going to use the very modest figure of 1.7 million species, noting that it's likely an underestimate of the true number, which could be as high as 8.7 million. For question three, we'll root our species at 600 million years ago. Clearly, life evolved much earlier than this date. Most states have this around 3.8 billion years ago. However, we're mostly interested in multicellular life, and the number of species known prior to 600 million years is much, much lower than after 600 million years. And 600 million years ago, life was rapidly diversifying. We will talk more about the early life during the Precambrian period later on this semester. For question four, the average duration of species, there's been a lot of estimates for durations of species in the fossil record, which varies between groups. Some groups, like mollusks, have long durations in the fossil record near 10 million years, while other groups, like mammals, have short durations around 1 million years. For the sake of simplicity in this study, we're going to use uh, the figure of 4 million years as the average duration for a species in the rock record. For question 5, um, how species richness has changed for geological time, we're going to need to look at a um, particular figure and calculate how the species richness has changed over time. This figure is a chart of the number of fossil marine invertebrate families over geological time, first developed by Jack Stabansky. The graph has been called the Stabansky curve. You can see five major extinction events, each numbered, but between each of these mass extinction events, the number of taxa or groups has grown. To keep things really simple, we'll convert this curve into a triangle, which approximates the same dimensions of the original curve. Using this approximate triangle, we can get an estimate of the total number of species that have ever lived by using the geometric formula for the dimensions of a triangle of species divided by the average species duration. Doing this, we get a big number, 127.5 million species existed. Using this number, which is likely a low estimate compared with the 300,000 known fossil species from the rock record, we discover that only 0.2% of the extinct species are actually known or have been named by scientists. 99.8% of the fossil record is unknown to science. Using this, we also find that 99.99% of life is extinct is a pretty good estimate. In fact, we find 98.7% of life is extinct. But again, this is, if anything, an underestimate. This is really not very good. Because what can we tell from 0.2% <laughs> of the species preserved in the fossil record about the history of our planet? Well, this may not be as bad as it seems. If we look at the number of living species, most living species are members of groups that don't preserve great fossils. Groups such as insects, and fungi, and nematodes. Paleontologists are quick to acknowledge that the fossil record of these groups are not spectacular and would never be able to reveal the true species richness in the fossil record. So rather than look at all the groups, let's narrow down to the nine major groups that are well represented in the fossil record. Life forms that produce hard parts, skeletons, they're easily fossilized. If we look at these nine groups of life forms, we see that the numbers make a little bit more sense. The number of living species is 150,000, with fossil species higher and 180,000 species when we look at just these nine groups. This means that the fossil record is, has a much higher proportion of the total number of known species. We can use the same calculations as before, using just these nine groups, and we see that the fossil record is better. 1.6% of fossil species have been named and 98.4% of the fossil species have yet to be discovered. We still have a lot to discover in paleontology, if it is true. But these numbers are a little bit better. They're better than 0.2%. So whether it's only 0.2% or 1.6% or 2.3%, we know very little about the diversity of the fossil record. This is the biggest criticism of paleontology. This is why paleontology is rarely taught in science, and it's rarely a requirement for a degree in biology.
Paleontology is often viewed by the other sciences as having to deal with the fact that fossilization is extremely rare and that little can be discerned from the fragmentary fossil remains that are discovered. More so now in the age of molecular biology, molecular analysis, and just massive huge data sets, the rarity of fossils and the paucity of fossil record seems to make paleontology as a scientist as a science uninteresting or unvalidated because of these low numbers. Even though we don't have a large sampling of species through time, we do have a small sample of data that can't be found or replicated elsewhere. Now think about the value of polling data where only a small percentage, often less than 0.2% of a population is asked a question. For example, uh, do you think the use of marijuana should be made legal or not? Of those surveys, trends can reflect the trends of the entire population, even if every single person was not asked that question. Hence, in paleontology, sampling and understanding the error associated with the sampling of fossils is critical to draw the best conclusions from the available data. Paleontology is still critical to address questions that are not easily addressed by only studying living species. Let us look at one of the common ways to understand sampling in the fossil record, the rarefaction, also pronounced rarefaction, technique. Rarefaction um, technique helps to determine when an adequate sample size has been reached, a sort of diminishing returns approach to evaluating the adequacy of a sample size. When rarefaction curves begin to flatten, additional sampling adds very little new information. The graph below um, shows the number of phyla, classes, orders, families, genera, and species reflected in rising numbers of fossil specimens sampled from the rock record. Note that as the number of specimens increase, which is the x-axis here, the total number of taxa found increases. But as you get more and more specimens, these curves begin to flatten, such that if you collect 100 more specimens, for example, the likelihood of discovering a new species decreases the larger the sample size. Rarefication is a simple formula to establish the number of species that would be found in a sample of n individuals. Where the number of individuals or specimens in a sample is n, the number of species is s, and the number of individuals of each species is ni. This summation equation will give a good estimate of the number of species. Let's look at an example of using this equation uh, in some examples here. So in this example, we have a number of sets of data where we've actually gone out and collected a bunch of fossil specimens. And from that collection of specimens, we then figured out which ones of these were unique and separated those out into separate species. And we'll talk a little bit more about what a species is and how to go about doing this. So what you'll notice is that the sample size, it's the largest sample, this is close to 3,000 specimens here, of course, has the largest number of species, 86. So of the 3,000 spe fossil specimens that are collected, 86 were uh, unique species. One of the things we can do is if we have a number of these samples is we can calculate sort of the estimated number of species using each one of these sample sizes. And this way we can kind of put error bars or what we can do is figure out how many specimens we have to collect before we can sort of be satisfied with the number of species that we've actually captured in our sample. So you'll note that in this chart, if we look at the number of specimens, as the number of specimens increase, we start to get uh, closer and closer to that 86 number. So that's when we're going to get things start to level out and flatten in the curve. So you can use these curves. Um, to do this um, in practice is sometimes difficult. Oftentimes you have to do this on the best sampled locality or horizon and then use that to basically see how other sites compare to that site that you're looking at. But rarefication is a really powerful tool and it's very useful in determining uh, how well sampled you are. Now one of the interesting things that can happen is that
if you look at different hierarchical groups, so if you're looking at whether you have representatives of different classes or orders or families or genera, you'll note that, that as your sample sizes increase, you're more likely to capture all the classes than you are all the species. And this is just because of this logarithmic decay model uh, looking at different groupings. And often this transcribes itself into studies that look at families in genera rather than species when you're looking at diversity through time studies. So for example, the Stabansky curve used the marine uh, invertebrate record to look at diversity through time rather than species because the fact that you're going to get capture all the species in the fossil record is less likely than capturing all the families in the fossil record. So there's this decay model of preservation that you see. So oftentimes paleontologists will use genera or families or orders even um, and less likely species. So that's starting to change. More and more paleontologists are starting to be able to get pretty good species numbers uh, based on these larger sample sizes that are being generated. Now this is not the only way to take a look at how good the fossil record is. Another way to look at how um, good the fossil record is, is to buy, by looking at the geographic exposure of rocks at different time periods and comparing that with a fossil record. So one of the things that's been observed is that the farther back in time you go, the less exposures of the rock of, uh, of that appropriate age is. So for example, if you're interested in studying the Cambrian here in, in Utah, there's a few places that you can go along the Wasatch Front where you can find some great Cambrian um, fossils. You can find them out in western Utah and a few places along the Uinta Mountains. But if you're interested in staying a much more recent period of time, say the Cenozoic or Cretaceous, for example, the Cenozoic is the yellow rocks here, which you can see occupies a huge portion of the state. The green indicate the Cret Cretaceous and Jurassic rocks which are also fairly well exposed compared to the Cambrian. So what one of the things that um, people have begun to do with these geological maps is sort of quantify the amount of sediment that's out there of each one of these to try to use that to, to play around with how good the fossil record is. So obviously the fossil record of the Cenozoic, those yellow rocks, are much better than Cambrian, which is the dark purple rocks that we see. So more exposures um, that we can look at. So this is another way of estimating how good the fossil record is. Now a fossil record that is meager may mean either that preservation of the organisms is very poor or that they express little evolutionary diversity themselves. And this has been a huge debate within paleontology. For example, here we're looking at the number of taxa, so this is mostly at the family level through time of various groups. We've got mammals, reptiles, echinoderms, and brachiopods. And one of the things you kind of notice is that, um, for example, with mammals, that after the extinction of the dinosaurs at the end of the Mesozoic era, we have the proliferation of mammals in the Cenozoic. Some scientists have debated that, in fact, this big jump in mammal diversity at the end of the Mesozoic is just an artifact of poor sampling, and then in fact many more mammals in the Mesozoic have yet to be discovered. And the reason that we don't see them until after the Cenozoic has to do with preservation. The same could be true with brachiopods. You see in a huge proliferation of brachiopods in the earlier period of time, and maybe the fact that we don't see brachiopods in the Mesozoic, they're less diverse, may have to do less with a change um, that occurred at the Permian-Triassic boundary it may have something to do with the fact that um, brachiopods are just not well preserved in the Mesozoic for whatever reason. So this makes it a really hard argument to, to disentangle between whether it's poor preservation or whether there's little evolutionary diversity. Paleontologists that view that the fossil record is pretty good at reflecting the data will argue that this is just a reflection of the actual evolutionary diversity during that time period. Brachiopods didn't do very good in the Mesozoic, but they did great in the Paleozoic. Mammals weren't very diverse in the Mesozoic, but they were very diverse in the Cenozoic. Whereas people that view the, pale the paleontological record as being very poor view this data and sort of argue that the reason for it is that it's poorly preserved.
So let's talk a little bit about preservation of hard parts. So one of the things that often we talk about is how um, evidence of life get transported into the rock record. And it's a very lengthy and complicated process, but I was going to touch upon some of the things that we need to consider when we talk about preservation and how good the fossil record is. The process of changing a living creature into an inorganic fossil rock in the rock record is referred to as diagenesis. The process from when an organism dies to when it actually gets discovered and named and put in a museum is the field of taphonomy. We'll talk more about taphonomy throughout this semester. One of the things that almost always happens during fossil preservation is that the parts that make up the animal get basically dissolved or replaced or remineralized. In the process of doing that, you can generate a cast or a mold. So either the internal mold, which is called a cast, or the external mold, which is called a mold. This can be done through um, replacement, either the replacement of the material on the inside, the soft gooey parts, or it could be the replacement of the skeleton itself. Premineralization is basically replacing the mineral with a different type of mineral. Oftentimes the minerals that the skeleton of the organism are composed of are not very viable in the subsurface. So as the um, organism has, the dead organism is buried and buried deeper into the subsurface, it, the mineral structure of its skeleton will start to change and remineralize. We'll talk more about this in a second. You can have uh, phosphate that actually is produced. And one of the things to be aware of is concretions they'll talk about. So replacement is basically taking whatever the mineral, the skeleton was composed of and replacing it with a different mineral. So in this example here, we see a ammonite that's been replaced with pyrite. So the pyrite was um, replaced, and so you get this sort of metallic um, luster looking ammonite. Sometimes the, it's completely um, dissolved, the skeleton, so for example, these molds, a cast in a mold of trilobite, um, are what you have left of the organism. There's no material in either of these cases that's original to the organism when it was living. Sometimes you encounter con concretions, and oftentimes concretions are mistaken for fossils. So I mention them now because you know, often encounter people that will show you a fossil and it tends to be a concretion. And often what people pick up thinking are fossils are concretions. Concretions are actually remineralized portions of rocks, oftentimes being replaced by some of the um, iron oxide uh, cement that can form in rocks. Concretions can actually form around fossils, so oftentimes you can break open a concretion and find fossils in there. They're actually formed um, by bacteria that grows around um, portions of dead organic matter that secrete some of these iron oxide uh, minerals like hematite and gortite and limonite. Um, and that pr um, produces this iron oxide staining, this rust color to these concretions that you often find. But concretions can also be um, calcium carbonate concretions. They can form under different types of um, soil concretions in the soils. Uh, they can form from roots or just even some bacteria growth in the subsurface. So they produce these interesting patterns and they tell some interesting information, but oftentimes they may not necessarily reflect uh, a living organism. So lots of things can happen when you take a living creature and try to fossilize it. One of the things that happens first when an organism dies is biological destruction. That is that portions of the organism may start to be uh, dissolved or eaten by other organisms, particularly organisms that are decomposers and rely on dead organic material as their primary food source. So for example, here's an abalone um, shell that's been infested with boring organisms. And some of these boring orga organisms probably led to the death of this little uh, shell and the reason that it died. So biological discussion can even happen before the organism dies. One of the other things that can happen is me mechanical destruction. 
of uh, organisms. So if we think about um, preservability, how well each of these shells would be preserved in the rock record, in the fossil record, we can see that you know, the shell that has a lot of um, spines coming off it, a very ornate shell, if it's tumbled in a surf or broken up on a beach, those pieces are going to easily break off of it and it may not preserve very well. Yet if you have a shell that doesn't have any of that ornamentation, really a uh, thick and robust shell, then it will likely survive a lot of that metallical destruction and it will be uh, better represented in the fossil record. And there's been some really fun experiments looking at me mechanical destruction. And here's an example of one that's in the reading. So for example, um, here the um, scientists took a number of uh, different organisms that they found uh, living along a nearshore marine system. Uh, it included um, this gastropod, Netrita, that they threw in. But it also included bryozoans and Corellia, which is this very fan-like, very brittle coral. Threw it in there, which is a bright, uh, threw it in there, tumbled it within just a few minutes. That was blown apart. And they did it over time and then calculated how much of the sample uh, was represented by each of these groups. So what's really interesting is that the Narita survived clear out here over 100 hours, whereas these bryozoans, these more brittle organisms, just didn't make it into the fossil record. So if this is representing the fossil record, you're offering sampling, not sampling the more brittle types of fossils that you just don't get preserved in the fossil record. The ones that have robust, strong shells are going to be the ones you're going to be oversampling. Here's another example, in this case, not necessarily looking at differences in the shells, but also kind of how the shells are constructed and main, uh, are made. And you can see that over time, as they tumble these in a rock tumbler, they, some of the uh, clams were able to survive, whereas the oysters tended to get busted apart into teeny little pieces and weren't as well represented, and eventually d get disintegrated when the rock tumbler keeps tumbling and tumbling and destroying these things. So some wonderful experiments have done, been done to looking at the taphonomy, that is the uh, sampling of each of these things. And these are things to be aware of when you're talking about the fossil record. Talk about chemical destruction. So one of the things that we'll discuss throughout this class is that various organisms compose their skeletons of different types of minerals. Most of them do with aragonite, but other organisms um, produce skeletons out of silica or calcite. Aragonite doesn't like to stick around when it's in the subsurface. It's, it's a very delicate uh, crystal lattice structure that's used in aragonite. And so when these fossils get buried, they tend to recrystallize into calcite or get completely dissolved. So in this example here, we have an ammonite with the original aragonite shell preserved, and that gives it that really cool, shiny, sort of mother of pearl effect. And then here we below, we have the very dull ammonite without the aragonite shell preserved. And in fact, they probably had a very pretty uh, mother of pearl sort of look with the aragonite on the outside of that ammonite shell, but it's just dissolved away. It quickly dissolves away in groundwater, even if it's just a little warm, the groundwater will totally replace or take away that skeleton. So chemical destruction is very common in the fossil record, oftentimes altering the skeleton as it's being preserved. So one of the things that paleontologists are very aware of is that when they go out to collect uh, fossils, they're often getting a subsample or a very skewed sample of the types of fossils that they're actually finding. And trying to quantify how this sample actually represented the original environment is very tricky and very challenging to paleontologists. But it's really important to try to figure out what the, uh, these things represent and able, be, being able to reconstruct what the environment was like in the past. I want to highlight, though, that the fossil record can be exceptionally great and that there is wonderful fossils of very delicate insects, wonderful fossils of very delicate jellyfish, things that we'll look at throughout the semester that really highlight that even though these fossils are extremely rare, they can give us just an incredible rich insight into the fossil record of the past.
For those of you watching this lecture outside of class, if you're interested in taking a course at Utah State University, check out the website geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in my own research and who I am, you can check out my website at benjaminslashberger.org. Thank you for watching.